Hi everyone, we are live. Um, I'm really excited about this webinar. I can't wait to dive into all the topics we have lined up here. But before I do that, I want to introduce our lovely guests. So Luke, we'll start with you. Do you want to go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Luke Duran, the founder of Ranking Academy. Uh, you may have seen me on YouTube uh, with all my videos. Uh, so yeah, I, I launched uh, Ranking Academy about eight years ago now after spending 20 years of my life in a corporate world, uh, working mostly in marketing and specifically in the SEO field for travel agency or travel company rather. And I uh, decided to move in full time uh, as a an SEO freelancer, so to speak. Uh, and uh, yeah, and that's about it, really. That's awesome. You're mod way too modest. For the record, like Luke has like one of the biggest uh, YouTube channels in SEO. Forget local SEO, in SEO in general. So if you haven't seen his videos, you definitely want to check out Ranking Economy because they are awesome. And uh, I, I have to give him a lot of credit. There's no BS in his videos. You, you get like really good stuff. So Thank kudos you to much. you for just sharing so much with the rest of us here. We really appreciate you joining. And Darren. Yeah, I just want to echo what Joy said. Luke, too modest, best local SEO channel out there. You're totally my inspiration for how to make great uh, local search educational content. You're just absolutely doing a great job on YouTube. Thank so you. uh, my name is Darren. I am the founder of WhiteSpark. Uh, I've been doing SEO, I don't know, 17-ish years. And uh, yeah, I, don't know. I think a lot of people know who I am. So I also do the local search ranking factor survey, and I do a lot of publishing stuff about SEO, local SEO in particular. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. And I'm Joy Hawkins, uh, owner, founder of Sterling Sky. Um, and we also have Local U, which does these webinars. Uh, we also do live events as well. So we're hoping to announce some dates for next year pretty soon um, and hope you can join us. And then of course the Local Search Forum, um, which is a free online forum for all things related to local search. Uh, gonna be talking about that a bit today. So um, if you're not familiar, it's a pretty great place to learn. Um, to kick us off, what I wanna basically encourage the audience we really want you to drive the content of this webinar. So I wanna hear what your questions are. So please do not hesitate to throw them in there. And then we're gonna try and get to as many of them as we can. So I have some ones that people sent in beforehand, but I really wanna try and make sure we get to your questions. So to start off, uh, Darren, we'll start with you. I wanna talk about what strategies this year specifically, or just maybe even more recent, but the later half this year at White Spark, what are you seeing work really well that you are going to essentially double down on next year um, that maybe you didn't know about earlier? In the mm -hmm. year? Well, I wouldn't say that we don't, we didn't know about them earlier, but, uh, oh wait. but offer posts, like they are really working well. Uh, if we think of any other kinds of, uh, Google Post, Google Post relegated to the basement of your Google Business profile, typically. But the offer posts are so great because you get the deals tab, you get the little tags on the thing. So uh, we've been seeing great success with offer posts of driving direct conversions. So just continuing with that, uh, definitely making sure it's a it's a key part of our strategy with optimizing Google Business profiles. Reviews are huge. And so we're continuing to refine and improve our review strategy. Uh, definitely not um, easing up on reviews. We find great value in that from both the ranking perspective and the conversion perspective. Specifically on the Google business profile, there's not a lot of things that are going to directly impact rankings, but we find reviews are one of our most powerful things to really help a client uh, climb the rankings. And I always wonder if it may, like, you know, there is some direct ranking benefit with reviews, but I often think about the secondary ranking benefit of user behavior signals. When you have the high star rating, when you have lots of reviews, you draw people into your profile and Google's like, ooh, people love this profile. We better rank it better because it's getting a lot of action. And I really think like we saw a lot of that coming out in the trials where uh, they explain that they definitely are using user signals. So. I, I also wonder about the secondary ranking benefits of reviews and really trying to focus on photos and videos. So more photos, more videos, both for, you know, just directly providing more content on the profile. It's, it's great con for conversion, 
But also it drives those secondary ranking benefits that we think because you get more engagement, more watch time. And so some of the things that we're doing, is we're having a really hard time getting um, videos from our clients. And so we're making our own. So we're taking like photos, putting them into slideshows, getting them profile, those kinds of things are uh, some of the strategies that we're working on and we're working really well. And we'll continue on those uh, going up to four. Awesome. Luke, what about you? Uh, I think I'm going to recommend my clients to buy tons of uh, reviews, geotag all their images, and do a lot of Google stacking stuff. Can you just like um, boot this guy from the webinar right now? Get up. Oh, man. <laughs> we didn't vet our people well. <laughs> so obviously, none of this stuff works, and I'm still surprised to see a lot of noise uh, around these topics. Um, I think to me, the, the stuff that's been working very well is... Uh, particularly for service um, area type of businesses, it to, is to work on awesome location pages uh, and make sure that they dial these down to the T and then they're able to produce content that matches with that location because that works super well. And even in some cases, I've noticed that some of these um, uh, businesses are able to clinch a spot in the Google map pack even though they're not located in that area, if they're close enough to it, if you've created good quality content for that area, you become super relevant and Google believes that, therefore, you deserve to be in that top spot and that's awesome. Um, uh, obviously, you have to be very careful with these. You don't want to create tons of them. You want to create the ones that are really close by uh, and, and that works a treat. From a content perspective, uh, again, when it comes to your services, it's the same principle. And I think so many businesses I deal with miss out on that. It's kind of like they use a cookie cutter type of solution to, to create content for their pages. And it's not personal enough. It's not unique. Uh, and, and you need to think about it from two angles. A, from the customer's perspective, first and foremost, I would say, because when they come on your website and they see that, then you want them. You want to convince them you're the best in the business, and the only way to do this is by showing who you are, putting pictures out, videos, all all this kind of good stuff. Uh, and obviously, the other angle is from Google's perspective, because you're displaying all of that. Then Google will reward you with higher ranking. So that works super well um, from your website's perspective, from a Google business profile perspective. I mean. It's, there's this one once you've you've done everything that you need to do there, uh, which is not very complicated. You know, make sure you filled in all the fields and you've updated your services, your product, and and then you've 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 done a hundred percent of what you need to do on your Google Business Profile. Then you just need to maintain it. Uh, so that comes by that it comes with adding images, adding videos now because videos are becoming more powerful. I'd, I'd uh, agree with Darren, particularly around reviews. You are able now to add videos to reviews, and these uh, are very, very well displayed in your Google business profile. And since that's more often than not the first thing that people will, will see when they come across your business, uh, they won't even bother going to your website. They'll see that stuff, and that's enough to convince them that, again, they want to do business with you. So I, I would definitely uh, focus on a lot of that as well. Yeah, I want to touch it. So you said service area pages, which is interesting. So that's not a new thing. That's been around for a long time. But what I do find fascinating is a lot of people think with these algorithm updates, everyone's talking about EEAT and like service area pages are kind of, let's be, let's be, they're kind of crap, right? Like they're not really anything awesome. So I've heard some people say like, shouldn't these you know pages be penalized and like they're just duplicate content and blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of fascinating because from my perspective, what we've been seeing is they're working really well for some industries, should clarify, they do not work for everybody. But um, in home services specifically, we still see they work really well. And I haven't seen any evidence that they are declining in value with all these algorithm updates. Like, are you guys seeing the same thing? Absolutely not, not, not from my perspective. Um, I think what you need to take into consideration as well is I believe the UK market is nowhere near as competitive as the US market, right? Uh, and uh, in terms of how businesses approach uh, web marketing or local SEO in, in general, um, they miss out on a ton of stuff. So if you're able to do the good stuff, then you're just going to be ranking very well, um, way better than anybody else. So in America... 
or in North America, I would say, it's a different story altogether. So because the location is very competitive, the verticals are also in some cases super competitive. Uh, so it's it's a lot harder when you when you try to build good location pages. But in the UK, for a small business, a uh, service area business, that, that works a treat. Yeah, I will mention, because you said the UK, we actually um, had a guy on the local search board who's from the UK who had a manual penalty for having 3,000 of them. So I would say, you know, proceed with caution, like they were literally the same, uh, I looked at the site, same exact pages, uh, but they were reworded, which was interesting. So he did reword every page to be different, but it was literally the same stuff. And then all the reviews were the same, like all the jobs were the same. And I was like, okay, but he got a manual penalty for it. Um, so I think you can, if you overdo it, maybe. Um, of course. That, territory. That, that would be the exception, not usually what we normally see. Yeah, 300, too far, come on. I, we, we have a client with over a thousand and they're fine. So, wow. Yeah. But they are a big one location. Long, no, 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 no. They have a no, lot okay, of right. like more than 50. <laughs> so I don't know how many per location, but yeah, like it's, you know, it, it, I'm not going to lie. Like it does scare me sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> something happened to these pages. It wouldn't be great for them, but um, yeah, yeah. they perform really well. So that's the one that Colin has published about where it, it, you know, just talks about they didn't really change the content on the pages too much, just changing the city name and they still actually work, right? That's a different one. But yeah, they, they have about like 30. Um, and yeah, that one literally, when I looked at their site, this was like five years ago when we first started working together mm -hmm. and their template literally just takes the city and swaps it out. So like, there's not even any content on the page. It's a template. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like the majority of his leads come from those pages. They rank amazing, uh, have ranked amazing for like seven years. And yeah, all, all that switches on the pages is the city. We did. I love that case study so much yeah. because it's like, it's this classic thing that all the SEOs say, oh, make sure you don't do this terrible, terrible thing. And then Colin's like, well, you know, it's working pretty good. <laughs> I, and I will clarify that like we did go and like add like unique reviews and we tried sure. to like make the pages different. Cause I remember like looking at this going, ooh, this would be bad if these pages As went do, down. Yeah, so for sure. Let's but... do all we can to make them unique. So yeah. on that front, one thing I will say that we've been focusing a lot more on recently that I think is applicable to most business types is getting more unique stuff on your pages. And what I mean by that, because I want to clarify, because everybody says that, but they don't actually say what they mean. There's two things I think that a lot of small businesses we see don't do often. Um, first is do-it-yourself content. And second would be cost data. So the do-it-yourself content, um, I'll use a lawyer example. We had a lawyer, let's say they're in Texas. They, they weren't. But when you would search for like divorce in Texas. The page that used to rank for them historically was always their lawyer page, like talking about lawyers in Texas and whatever. And over the years, we've actually seen they, they published this one page on how to get a divorce in Texas. And it's like, if you want to get divorced without a lawyer and do it all yourself, these are all the steps. And my God, this page is long. And all I'm thinking is like, anybody reading these steps is gonna be like, screw it, I'm just gonna hire you, right? But they get a ton of conversions from that page, but it was not easy. It's not easy to convince people to do that because they're like why would i publish a page on how to do it for free it's like the people on twitter they're like joy why would you tell people about this new algorithm thing when they're your competition and it's like no you you actually can develop expertise and especially if you're a divorce lawyer like once they read the how to do it yourself they're probably not going to want to do it um so that's one example that we've seen and then the, the cost stuff again is something that we have to really try and convince clients but like the impact it can have to rankings is very substantial. If you put in cost information, um, it, it's, it really does well. And it doesn't matter if you are the cheapest. So but It's a very interesting point you're raising here because, uh, and that's one of my pet peeves, when uh, businesses are not transparent enough uh, because they're trying essentially to hustle you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got a, a client who uh, has launched a phone service, is an electrician and, and offers phone support, troubleshooting, right? And then you'd think, hey, if someone contacts him, his best bet is to actually go to these people's house and charge a premium for the fact that he's actually been there. But instead, he's able to pick up the phone and solve the problem within 15 minutes. There's a small charge. Everybody's happy. Uh, and, and I've now encouraged him to make videos and, and launch a YouTube channel to share some of the tips 
with potential clients that he can refer to. And he doesn't even charge these people. On the back of it, however, he will get some reviews because he's able to ask for Google reviews and say, hey, thanks for your help, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I think if he develops a relationship with the community, he will get some referrals. So there's a lot of other benefits. And holding back information just in order to capitalize on a few hundred bucks just because that's very short-sighted, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I, I never hold back on anything. If I've got a secret, I, trust me, it's not going to be a secret for long. I'll share sure. it. Yeah. Well, and this is the thing that I would say, like, listen, if you're in the camp, you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to put my prices on, try it. If it doesn't work, take them off, right? Absolutely. Um, what I would suggest you do when you put it up there, obviously put your, you can put a range. I always tell people, you don't have to say like, yeah, if you hire me to do this service, it's going to be exactly $526. Like you can put a range in there. Um, but if the page doesn't rank better and doesn't convert better, then just take it off in a, a month or two. Right. So there's really no harm there. Um, there's Thank a couple of questions. Yes. Speaking of secrets, oh, I yeah. heard you got one. We're when, getting to that. Are you going to reveal that? Everyone's, everyone's that. wondering. I promise. And I won't do it at the end. It'll come soon. There is a couple questions that were related to the stuff that we were talking about here. So I wanted to um, try and highlight some of those. So this one, how much uh, content should there be on location pages? Uh, Darren, you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, sure. As much as it takes to convey the message that is required to convert that person to to become a customer. And I would say I've seen pages with just a couple of paragraphs ranking really well. And I've seen pages like the one that Joy described where it was like 17,000 words long, also ranking really well. So it really is like, I think it does come down a lot to those engagement signals. Are people consuming that content? Are they staying on that page? Are they bouncing back to the search results? So if you have a great page, then regardless of, of how long it is, it doesn't really matter. So there is no specific length that I can recommend. Um, I would say this is a really key thing. If you're gonna go long, do not do the wall of text. The wall of SEO text is the kiss of death because people will bounce off of that because it's too painful to read. They, they didn't come to your website to read a book, like a whole novel. They came to your website to get answers to their questions. And so make sure that if you have a lot of content, it's really well broken up with bullet points, images, headings, really go the extra mile, have little call out things, maybe a little video, really make your page engaging because that's the key. You want people to stay on the page and you want you want their questions to be answered. And you don't want them to have to go back to the search results to get the answer. And this is where I think Joy's comment about the pricing information on the page can be really powerful because you want to answer all possible questions on that page related to that topic. And so there is no link. Yeah. And that, that leads well into this next question. Actually, a few people asked this. Um, so I'll start and then I just want to get your guys' favorites. What is a good example of a good location page? Personally, my favorite is Home Depot. They have really solid location pages with all the right information. They've got lots of SEO kind of content on there, talking about all the different things you can get at Home Depot. So they're my best example. Luke, what about you? I don't have a specific example. I mean, I go I go through so many websites of so many businesses, uh, and you know you can find loads of. The best way to find a good location page is you go to Google, you search for a service, and you add a location to it, and go and see what comes up first, and start comparing. Uh, and then you'll see, as Darren said, it will depend on industry as well. Uh, if you're a dentist and you're trying to have a location page for teeth whitening, you may have to go through a lot of stuff. Uh, but if you're in a different industry, you may just need to, to cover it in a couple of paragraphs. So um, I, I wouldn't be able to, I, I, I don't think it's fair to just send out a, an example like that. Uh, I think it's best if you look for your specific industry in your specific area to find out what really works best and try to not only replicate that, but do even better than that. That to me, that would be the best approach of, of unearthing the best location pages. I'm going to go with Home Depot as well. That is the one. In fact, I tried to find really good location pages and I can't. So you know what that means? It's a huge opportunity. If you are a multi-location business, you can really have a big impact by 
doing the location page, right? Filling out all the stuff, having all the stuff. Home Depot is a great example. U-Haul does a decent job. Home Depot is better. U-Haul location pages are not too bad, but I can't really find a great location page in legal. I can't find great location pages in dentistry. It's mostly these sort of like huge big brands that tend to have, they got a team of like 50 SEOs working for them and they, they really work on this stuff. And so Home Depot, 100%, that's the best one I could ever find. Well, this one kind of leads into, um, so how different does it need to be? So I want to clarify something on here because um, I think this is a misunderstood concept. So pest control, I see these guys are in pest control. So you probably have, you know, 15 different service areas that you service, let's just say. Uh, you could have the same page about all those different areas, theoretically speaking. I'd probably reword a bit of it, put a unique uh, review on it, uh, put in unique photos for that area. Like there's all kinds of things that you can do to make them slightly unique. The actual content about what you do, what type of pest control services you offer, it's going to be the same across each of them. And you don't, you shouldn't have to worry about that because you're not competing for the same keywords. One of them would be compete, like one of them would you want to rank for like pest control Buffalo, and maybe the other one would be pest control New York City, and the other one would be pest control Philadelphia. None of those are competing. Where you run into issues with duplicate content is when you have multiple pages targeting the same keywords. And that's where we come in with like content pruning. And we've seen some really great lists, uh, lifts, sorry, to ranking from combining those types of pages that are all targeting the exact same thing. So I just want to clarify that because I feel like it's kind of a misunderstood kind of thing. There's a lot of questions about this topic. Um, but I'm going to move on because I know we got a lot to cover. So the second question that I had for you guys is what is not working? Let's talk about like strategies that you are pulling back on next year that like used to work and really just don't anymore. Uh, and Darren, we'll start with you this time. I just have one in this category and it is spam fighting. Ugh. Google is making it so hard these days. So we've had to set thresholds of number of attempts when, and then when we just throw our hands up and be like, okay, stop, like don't bother continuing to file the redressals. Don't bother continuing to suggest an edit. Like it's just not even worth it. So we, we do stop, uh, I think after five, after five redressals, we're like, it's never going to happen. Google's never going to fix whatever the problem is. And so we just give up. And so it is definitely less effective. Our, per, our success rates are lower. We do track that really carefully uh, in terms of percentages. And you know the success rates are getting lower and lower. And so spam fighting, that's annoyingly not working. And I think it's related to lack of resources at Google, probably uh, more and more of these reports coming in, they can't handle them all, you know, less staff to actually review them properly. And so I don't know, I think it's just a, it's a problem of scale at Google. That's my guess anyways, but it's the working less. And so that's the one that we're, we're doing a little bit less of. Luke, what about you? Uh, Geotagging pictures. Sorry, that's it. That's the last one I mentioned that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I think citations, I mean, these have been, these have been going, uh, pretty badly for a while, but I think citations aren't really a thing anymore. Uh, and as long as you do the basic ones, uh, then you're going to be all right, uh, particularly if you're starting off. Uh, but if you've been going for some time, I, I think it's, it's an absolute waste of time. Uh, if you want to get some links, then you might as well do some proper link building and forget about this stuff because it doesn't really work. So that would be the one that I think uh, is something that I wouldn't consider. It's just almost like a one-off, you know, you just do a bunch and uh, and then once you're done, that's it. Uh, you, you don't have to carry on. I agree with Darren as well. We were talking about this, Joy, uh, particularly about spam fighting. I mean, this is... This is very frustrating because uh, it doesn't seem fair towards businesses who don't spam. Um, but then you, you don't want to fight against something where you're going to waste your time and your resources and potentially your money. So sadly, uh, this is something that probably is a good idea to not spend too much time on either. So Can I respond to the citation? Uh, I know. I was like, wait, I was watching Darren's face. <laughs> I saw I, I, I saw your video, Darren, by the way, about citations, right? Yeah. I did see it. So I was very mindful when I actually said that. <laughs> I, I, don't dis I don't disagree. Uh, I, I think you're right when you said 
it's kind of a once and done thing, right? You, you, you lay the groundwork, you get it done. You don't really have to keep worrying about it. There is a, a realm where you can continue to identify um, industry specific ones. I do think there's great value in those city specific ones. Um, so those do like, you can check out your competitors, keep finding them, but it, you then eventually run out of steam with citations hundred percent. And I always want to talk about cleanup because there is this sort of long standing myth in the local SEO community that citation consistency is so important. And it this is a thing that used to be the case when Google was really dumb. Google's really smart now and Google knows how to connect the dots. And so citation consistency is not a harmful thing anymore. I think that there is a case to be made for citation audit and cleanup when you have a branding issue, your name is kind of wrong around the internet and just for optics, you wanna have that correct. So a lot of people hire us for that. Another one is, Google keeps changing your dang info on your Google business profile. They keep putting the wrong phone number, whatever. That's another reason why you're like, okay, fine. I got to clean up the web. And that's because you, you say your phone number is this on your Google business profile. Google says, okay, business owner, that's cool. But I looked at the whole internet and the whole internet says your phone number is this. So too bad for you. I'm going to change it. That's what's another thing that happened. So there's a case for cleanup in, in those. And then uh, I had another one and it just totally fled my mind. What was it? Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you later when I, when I remember. What All right. All right. You tell me. Just, but just it, it is up. valuable. You, I, I do think it's a kind of like you should lay the groundwork. You should get your citations distributed. But then, yeah, you don't have to keep doing it over and over. It's a once and done thing. Yeah, so um, this one here, uh, I'll answer this question about suggesting name changes. We were again discussing this right before. So so my take on this is it's usually a waste of time. Like try it. Darren having five attempts, man, I wouldn't even do that many. I would probably do three max um, if it's a name change once or twice. Because if they change it back, guess what? They're just going to keep doing that over <laughs> and over and over again. So yeah. like it's honestly a, a big waste of time. Um, and so that's, I think it's also just businesses have realized it's not that hard to get a DBA and uh, be able to, yeah. to use that name on your listing kind of uh, without worrying about violating guidelines. We have a video on our YouTube channel on how to do that. It's really not that hard though. Like just get a DBA, update your logo, update your website. <laughs> Google doesn't suspend for this. This is another <laughs> misconception. They People yeah. think, oh, if you add keywords to your business name, you're gonna get suspended. I, I do not, I, I have polled a lot of Google business profile product experts and they're like, I can't think of a single time. <laughs> that doesn't happen. No. The, only, the only thing that can happen is that if someone re files redressal and then that flags actual violations that Google cares yeah. about, that's how that. keywords in the business name could get you suspended. But it's not the keywords in the business name that got you suspended. It's because you were out like a freaking virtual office or something. <laughs> that's, that's a violation that could get you suspended. But the keywords in the business name, doesn't and it, it sounds like I'm now telling you to go put keywords in your business name. And I'm I'm really not what you said. there are branding issues that you should be thinking about, but there is great ranking benefit from doing it. And so putting a little effort to actually get the DBA, change your logo, change you know content on your website, uh, update some citations. I don't know, it's a great ranking benefit to doing it. And then all of us stupid spam fighters trying to take it down, Google's like, nah, get out of here. We don't care. So I don't think. Yeah, I'm just gonna stop talking about spamming Google's business yeah. name now. It, and what's next? It used it used to work well. I, I'll I'll just touch on my. Uh, I was pretty much gonna say the same thing as you guys. Um, in regards to citations, we've pulled back on creating more of them, right? So exactly like Darren and Luke both kind of said, uh, we pulled back a lot. We used to have a list of like you know 200 different sites that were um, things you could submit to, and the majority of them, I think we narrowed it down to like 10. Um, and then with the 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 industry specific one, because if you're a lawyer, for example, there are a lot of legal sites that rank really well on Google, they get a lot of traffic like Avo and Martindale and lawyers of comics. Um, and you want to be on those. So that's where I'm like, it, it definitely does vary. Um, but as far as link building goes, we have overhauled all of our link building strategies this year. We ditched a ton. Um, so basically what we're seeing with link building, which we haven't released any of this stuff yet, but it's all coming in our blog and YouTube channel next year. Um, anchored links are the best. Like way better. So I realize that sounds spammy, but if you can have anchor text in your link, the impact you will see that it makes to organic ranking is insanely higher than a non-branded um, anchor like, you know, whitespark.ca versus best local SEO Edmonton, you know. So when you can find ways to do that, that's really where we're seeing. Um, 
I, I want to address, there's a lot of comments about checklists. So I do think we plan on putting together a checklist and, and putting it out afterwards of all the different things that came up in this webinar. So for everybody asking, yes, we will do that. Um, all right, should we get to the, should we get to the new ranking factor? Do you guys think yeah. that? Oh I'm my God, people? yeah, let's do it. I was like, I'm not going to make them wait till the end. That's just mean. Okay, so in case you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, uh, I tweeted and posted on LinkedIn um, back on Monday, uh, a big teaser. And I, I feel kind of bad about this because I'm like, it's a lot. I got yelled at by from a couple people that were like, really, you're making me register for a free event? So like, but I was like, no, like, I just, <laughs> I thought it would be fun to talk about it on the webinar. Um, and I didn't even tell Darren, like Darren messaged me and I, I didn't tell him because I was like, no, it'd be more fun if you have no clue what the heck I'm talking about. So I'm going to um, have Richard pull up that image and basically I'll explain what exactly is going on here. So there's an image that um, I put on Twitter, this one here, before and after. So this is literally a business and this rank grid is a two hour window um, apart. So the one on the left was taken at 7 a.m. The one on the right was taken at 9 a.m. Same day, same keyword. Hours are now a ranking factor. And what I mean by that is when your business is closed, you basically vanish, like you don't rank at all. And we've already run into this with clients. Um, we had somebody email us and we're like, I'm not ranking, they were looking at 2 a.m. Uh, we had another one talk to us the other day because a whole bunch of their locations are temporarily closed. And those like locations are now invisible, like they don't rank at all anywhere, which is new, they they used to. Um, we saw this start starting to happen with the core algorithm update in November, so it is new. I went back, I checked screenshots, mm -hmm. um, this business had no problem ranking at 7 a.m. back in October. Like they did. They ranked perfectly in October. So it was right at the beginning of November. Somebody posted on the local search board and saying, what the hell is going on with rankings? They're changing by the hour. And we did a whole whack load of scans. And they literally do change by the hour because as businesses close and open, the competition gets either bigger or smaller. So depending on your competition, you either rank better or worse. Is that making sense so far? Yep. <laughs> like it's... It's crazy though, because it's like so different. We had some scans where we were scanning them before the clients were open. We're like, oh my God, what happened? Like they just <laughs> fell off a cliff and then we scan it two days later. Oh, it's fine. But I wasn't connecting the fact that we were scanning at like 7 a.m. on one and 2 p.m. on the other because it never used to make a difference. And now it does. What is the date? When did you see this happen? This shift? The beginning of November. Yeah, see, because so, I've tested this before and I'm like, oh no, it doesn't make a difference. And yeah. I, I, Neil had actually talked about this being a thing where, oh yeah, if you're close, you're not gonna rank. But I, but then you look at the rankings, you're like, like, well, what happens if you're looking for a personal injury lawyer at midnight? Right, so you only get the ones that are 24 hours. How really consistent has it been it. throughout your tests? <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, uh, uh. So we had a dermatologist. We tried different different industries as well. Dermatologists, we scanned them on Saturday. They're not, they're not sorry, it was a psychiatrist. Uh, we scanned them on Saturday. They rank nowhere. Like they're like gone because they're not open Saturdays. And then during the week, they're ranking everywhere. And we also scanned like hours difference with several different verticals. <laughs> you don't believe as me. the owner of a company that runs a rank tracking software, this is terrible news, Joy. I was like, I knew you were going to, so what you should do, Darren, and this is my advice to you, not as a owner of a rank tracker, but like, yeah. I don't know how much of your ranking reports run during the night. They all, that run, would be they a... all run at night. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a problem. And then the damn thing runs all, all night. And then you oh. wake up in the morning. Oh, look, and there's my ranking report. And so that's it's yeah. like by design so that you get your yeah. ranking. Google hates you. I need to <laughs> investigate this, but I, I have a little bit of skepticism. Okay. Um, but I'm going to test it myself. This is, this is very annoying if, the, if true from a rank it's, tracking perspective. It's insane. Like we were literally, uh, the, that screenshot that I shared was two hour difference. Like, yeah. and it was before they were, uh, open versus how many tests have you done? This, like, like a, a thousand like, or like, you know, a dozen of your clients who've checked this would be like, oh yeah. I've looked at thing. least about a dozen. So yes. Um, but yeah. And, and different verticals. Because I was like, you know, this actually makes sense because like, think about it. Like how many times do you search for restaurants and it's so irritating because all you get are the ones that are closed. Yeah. So that makes sense. Like part of me is like for a lawyer, I'm like, maybe, maybe you want to talk to somebody right now and you only want the ones that are open. I feel like yeah. either one, this is a bug or two, uh, which I'm leaning more towards. Google has enough click data to see that people just always keep putting show open, show open to the point where mm -hmm. they're like, why wouldn't we just do this automatically? That's what I think. But it could yeah. be a bug. I mean, I guess we'll have that, to that, mean, that means that potentially we're going to end up with almost all businesses open 24-7, right? That's what I was worried about. Yeah. 
So this is the thing. So I'm thinking through this through, right? We're talking to clients. We've already had these conversations with clients. We've already had clients notice this. This is why I'm pretty confident it's not just me. Also on the local search forum, there was several people chiming in on this thread saying they're noticing the same thing. All these ranking differences based on the hour of the day. Um, the problem with just going and putting yourselves as 24 seven is negative reviews. People will get pissed if they call you or show up at your location in your clothes. Like I've seen it happen. We've actually gotten a negative review ourselves from somebody that couldn't get through under phone lines because we had an issue with a phone system. So like if people are calling yeah. you after hours, you're saying I'm open and it's and your voicemail says, hi, we're closed. That's like, like I would not do that. But it's going to be it, a matter of um, measuring pros versus cons and rewards versus benefits right if you're if you suddenly open 24 7 you gain maybe another i don't know how many hours throughout the week right if you normally close yeah. weekends and so okay maybe you'll be able to uh, suffer a few negative reviews and piss a couple of people off but if that means you don't miss out on leads you know is yeah. but if you just also hook up a, a call answering service so yeah you a lot of these services you can answer them they're not that yeah. expensive the number of leads you're going to get but this is a problem i think for google and i wouldn't be surprised if they roll it back for this reason yeah, everybody's absolutely. now open 24 7. like i don't know this is where i was like i didn't want to kind of announce it ahead of time but like we, who knows right like this could stick it couldn't stick it has been around for several weeks so it's yeah. i'm confident enough that if it is a bug they don't know it's a bug um <laughs> but um so I'm going to, there's a lot of questions. I got to address a couple here. So as far as the solution goes, I don't think there is a one size fits all solution here. I think you literally have to look at the pros and cons because again, like the negative reviews is a big problem. Like if you list yeah. yourself as open and you're not, that'll piss off your customers and you do not want that as a business. The other like thing, physical yeah, location, yeah. that's a big problem. You're yeah. actually yeah. location. You can't mess with your hours. Service yeah, area like businesses can definitely take advantage yeah. of this with a call answering service. They're already doing that. Well, most of them, I'd say, the, sm the smart yeah. ones. But like the um, the thing I'm thinking, like, you know, if you're searching for a dentist and you want a dentist that's open Saturdays and you find one, you're like, no, they're open Saturdays and they're not actually open Saturdays. Like that is not a good experience. So I think for small businesses, you have to actually look at like, when are your calls coming in? When are your leads coming in? And then make decisions based on that. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention this one. So um, I'm guessing this is Greg Gifford, but this whole like, it's against guidelines. So absolutely, just to be completely clear, if you are a storefront, so let's say you're a dentist and you list yourself as being open 24 hours a day, yes, you are breaking Google's guidelines. Um, I will also say I've never seen any enforcement on this. There's that. Um, and a lot of industries already do this. So like we see this all the time in the garage door space or in the legal space. They're all 24 hours. Well, not all actually, a lot of them are. Um, so in those cases, yeah, like if you're a business type where people don't show up, um, a lot and you do get lots of leads after hours you do want to maybe look into a, a, an after hours answering service or some way of actually being able to deal with those leads you do not want them hitting a voicemail that's that's my caution um but it's yeah let me see what else what you got. um i know it's crazy well like, I was, like a firework on the screen or something come on richard press a button so <laughs> as far as tools that were used to track somebody asked that um yeah so a bunch so uh place to scout i believe right bright local was one that people were using and local falcon on the forum um so it wasn't just one i had no idea i'm pretty sure our clients that were reporting it to us were just searching on google um themselves so quite a bit um and uh, I just, and also somebody asked about LSA. So we're not seeing this impact LSA. I, I think LSA is totally separate. Um, so what I'm talking about here is three pack rankings. Um, and uh, let me put another one up here. This person's asking if you're closed over the weekend, somebody looking for a distance near me. Yes, you literally won't show up. Crazy, right? Like, but this is where I'm also like, look at your leads before you freak out, look at your leads. And see how many leads you get on the weekend. Like, are you getting lead forms? Are you getting calls? Because like, I feel like that's the, the real question here. We looked at a, a divorce lawyer that I was like, oh, like they're nine to five. Do they want to stay nine to five? And they got about four calls after 6 p.m. in the last month. So it's like, okay. It's a very, it's a very strange logic, isn't it? Because if, if, if I, I have a toothache, uh, it's not an emergency. I'm able to wait, and it's the weekend, and I'm looking for a local dentist. Then I'm not going to see maybe the best option, right? Just because Google is not showing that 
to me, it's, it's a bit weird that Google would make this move. I don't doubt that your, your test is great. Uh, I just find it very, very weird that they would rule this out. Same. Yeah, it's, be not, about it's not a great experience. Like, I think it's going to be a result in worse search results. Absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna tweet Danny. We're gonna bug the hell of him after this, guys, and see what he has to say. Because I don't know, like, could be a bug, right? It wouldn't be the first time that they rolled yeah. something out and it wasn't intended. But I will confirm this has been around for a few weeks. It's not like brand brand new, but it's at the point now where we're starting to hear about it from other people. Um, so, I got a yeah. message in my Twitter DMs, and someone was like, "What's happening to the rankings?" I'm like, "Everything looks fine to me." I didn't notice that right? now for sure, 100. percent It was this hours thing. It's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. uh yeah, time to buy stock in the answering services. <laughs> um I believe this one, and I, I want to give a disclaimer here. Somebody's asking about additional hours. Um, I don't believe they impact ranking. And I'm gonna say that I, I'm pretty sure uh Yan, if you're listening, Yan was testing this. Uh he was testing additional hours. Um we'll have lots of tests coming out on this, but um I, I think it's it is based on your main set of hours. I don't believe your other hours are what um it's based on, but I'm not hundred percent sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions on there, but I know we definitely have other topics. So I think, I think we can move on if you guys are good. I'm going to just start going through some of the questions that have come in. Sure. Um, all right. So a lot of these are related to Google posts, which I know you've already covered. So, um, Google stacking stuff. I want this one. Oh, that's a DS. <laughs> That's as good yeah, as, go, go as, for as go. tagging. Luke, Luke, tell us what your thoughts are on this. Complete crap. Avoid <laughs> it like the plague. It's just, it's never worked. It's nonsense. Yeah. It's rubbish. People sell this service. I don't know why. Uh, it's, uh, oh my God. I, I don't know where to start. Uh, it's, don't waste your time with this crap. It's just, yeah, that, that's all I have to say about it, really. Yeah, no, that's a, uh... That's, I don't think there's anything more to say, so we'll move on. Um, as far as uh, website location pages, uh, so thoughtful guidance on how to create these better. Uh, there's a couple questions around this. Like, should you include neighborhoods, suburb names, what things should be on here? Um, yeah, any thoughts on that? I got a checklist of location pages. Uh, definitely review embeds. So you want to embed your reviews. That's fresh content. Every time you get a new review, you want to pull it into the page. There's great software for that. Um, their uh, staff bios, I think this is an overlooked opportunity because that's really good, unique content. So who are the staff at that particular location? Get their little photo, little bio. What do they love about it? Um, products, services that are unique to that location. Make sure that those are featured and it's not just bullet points. You're actually describing those. Uh, I have like a, like a 24 point Twitter thread <laughs> where I went through all of the things. So you can probably find that on my profile. Um, Jobs you've done there. Oh, yeah. Case studies, jobs, before and afters. I love the before and after. So if you're yeah. in a business that, that you know, it's like, this is what their pool looked like before we did it. And this is what their pool looks like now. Absolutely. Like That's really great content. And you can do that on a location basis. I think a really big thing. Oh, yeah. Let me give you one more. Frequently asked questions. And the frequently asked questions can be really customized by location in a nice way. You could you could duplicate it. We We've identified that. Duplicate content on these location pages doesn't really harm you. So you could have the same FAQs on every single location page. But I think it's beneficial to give the questions to that store manager and ask them to answer them. And then you could like record them and then you get it transcribed, get ChatGPT to kind of clean it up a little bit. And now you've got all this really great kind of unique location specific content on those pages. So, OK, I'll stop. Those are some of the ideas I have. Those are good answers. All right, Luke, I'll throw this next one at you. Um, I'm going to add in your photos because I, I saw another question that was similar. Um, people are talking about, you know, photos not getting approved, posts not getting approved. Usually it's the photo in the post and then videos not getting approved. What are your tips for those problems? Trying to stick to the guidelines. Uh, very often it's it's an issue with the content of the image. Yep. Uh, uh I, I recently published a, a really small video about how to check your um, uh, how Google sees your images by using Google Vision AI. So sometimes the content is perceived as being too explicit uh, when it isn't. So typically, let's say you you work for a spa or a uh, massage 
um, salon or something like that, and you want to advertise your services and you may be displaying too much flesh and it will be perceived by Google as being too explicit when it isn't. So I would say, uh, first of all, just try to check whether or not those images pass the test. Um, in some cases, I don't know why Google just will filter them out. Uh, in this case, I always advise people to reach out to Google because I don't always know the answer. Uh, for videos, a lot of people get problems with videos because they're not the right size, they're too heavy, they're too long. So little, little details like that, that will throw your videos out. So make sure you stick to, again, uh, the um, spe specification of, of the videos. Uh, and hopefully that should do the trick. Thank you. I'm gonna, uh, this one here, local service ads, do you think they will hurt? <laughs> so I, I can take this one. Um, we did a study when local service ads first launched for uh, lawyers, and it definitely does steal some traffic from the local pack, for sure. Um, so it does do that. That being said, if they're launched, you better be in them. <laughs> Otherwise, that traffic's now just going to your competitors. So... I mean, it, it kind of hurts, but there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well participate. That's my, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. All right. Uh, more questions about duplicate content. Um, all right. Duplicate content impacting ranking. Okay. So I feel like we talked about this quite a bit, but um, I do think the duplicate content, there's no penalty, just to be clear. Um, but essentially you cannot have... Usually if two pages rank for the same term, you are cannibalizing efforts that we talked about. So if you actually see multiple pages of your site ranking for the same thing, you will likely see a ranking increase if you combine those pages. We've done this like dozens of times. Um, so that's kind of how we personally handle duplicate content. Um, Darren, I don't know if that's how you guys do it at White Spark. Yeah, we don't worry too much about it. Like if we're talking about duplicate content across location pages, I think that uh, we've we've seen so much evidence that it doesn't have a negative impact that uh, we just carry on. We like to we like to mix it up. We like to, we want those pages to be fresh and engaging and have location specific content. But if the client won't give it to us and all we get is just swapping out the the city name, we'll we'll take it. We'll still do it because there's still benefit in it. There's this no penalty. There's no yeah, such they're, thing they're, as duplicate no. content penalty. That's what you might so, be. Some people think that. Be like, oh, I'm going to get penalized by Google. That doesn't happen. No. I mean, we have had problems. So, like, we see this a lot with personal injury lawyers because there's literally, like, you know, 50,000 um, pages that are exist on every single topic. Uh, sometimes you'll publish a page and you'll be like, oh, okay, I'm going to publish a page about brain injuries in Chicago. And Google already has, like, 50,000 pages about brain injuries in Chicago. So you won't actually be able to get your page to index or rank anywhere because there's nothing on it that Google doesn't already have 50,000 times. So that's, I think that's maybe what people are meaning when they're talking about it's a bad thing. Yeah, suppression, like not able to rank because you've got this duplicate content. And I think that does lead into a much broader conversation about EEAT. It, you know, your content, if you can write from experience, I think is maybe the biggest thing right now. It is a unique experience. This is why Reddit is exploding. This is why Quora is exploding. It's because people are talking about their very specific, unique experiences. That's something you might want to take to your content because it does absolutely help uh, to be able to write about experiences because that's something Google hasn't seen before. Yeah, there might be a, you know, a thousand pages on brain surgery. I can't remember what your example was, Joy, but might be a thousand examples on that. But yours is, it's not just like the same content that was spun through chat GPT. It's actually, this is the case that actually happened. And this is how we solved it. Like that, that's the content that Google's really trying to surface. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting question. So I put it up here. Um, so they have a client that's previous SEO is um, focusing the homepage for a term neglecting the service area pages. Now they optimize service area page and neither are ranking well. <laughs> That's quite an interesting predicament. I don't know if the service area page was ranking before, but I usually do not mess with stuff if it's ranking. Like if one page is already ranking, don't go optimize another page for it. Um, but I think the answer also varies quite a bit based on how many locations the business has, because we have a lot of multi-location businesses and you don't really want to rank the home page for a specific geo um, because they've got like 30 locations. So check the know, internal has... links. Could mm -hmm. be improperly internally linked. You want internal links in the content itself that drives to those service pages. So if you're going to take, you know, our homepage used to target Invisalign and now we made a new page of it and we don't even mention Invisalign on the homepage. Well, I'm not surprised. So 
that you still have to have a little blurb about Invisalign and then internally link to that in the content. You can't just use your navigation or your footer. You actually should be linking internally. And that might be one thing that might solve that problem. Yeah, um, I'm going to address this one. We haven't talked about AI yet. I was like, it's got, it's got to come up, right? Um, Luke, I'm going to address this one to you. Have you found any good ways to use AI with local SEO? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I use ChatGPT every day. Uh, that, that's one of the AI examples. I, I'm, I think that's the main one, to be fair. Uh, I think AI is wonderful. Uh, at the same time, you have to be very careful how you use it. Uh, and it's not a matter of just asking ChatGPT to spit out some content which you're going to plonk on on your website. That's not going to work. There's been proof that uh, proof that it's just you're eventually going to get annihilated by Google. What uh, I use uh, ChatGPT for is to help me pull out and build pages that are of good quality and recommendations. And I've got, I don't want to do a, a shameless plug here, but I've got a video coming out next week, hopefully that will cover some of this topic on how to improve your content using chat GPT uh, and enrich your content and integrate things like EEAT, because I think that's going to be key uh, in next year for any kind of local business. Uh, authenticity is going to play a huge part because of AI, because the industry is now uh, swamped with so many AI tools that uh, being genuine is what will be rewarded. Customers are not fools. They will know who's real, who's not, who's genuine, who's not. And the only way to prove this is by creating content that's, a, that's able to convey this. And AI cannot do this. You know, creating a video of a plumber fixing uh, a sink at someone's home, um, I don't think an AI tool will be able to produce that. Getting a, a video testimonial from one of your clients, maybe you, you might be able to do that, uh, potentially. But all of this stuff is going to be irrelevant. So, yes, use AI to facilitate your tasks. Uh, so, for instance, I write a lot of, of content uh, and I write it from scratch and then I put it into ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to help me correct it or uh, the grammar, the spelling, because I'm not English native. So my English is not 100% uh, you know, proof. So I use ChatGPT for that to reformulate, to use different tones of voice and, and so on and so forth. So I think AI is wonderful, but it has limitations. And because of that, authenticity will be rewarded later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a solid. I think, Luke, there was actually a question for you on videos on here somewhere. Because um, you had mentioned videos. Here we go. Um, yeah, you said, you can clarify, it's, videos can sometimes pose issues, how to take care of them. Can you clarify on that? Uh, well, as I said, it, it, uh, the issues are mainly caused by how heavy the video can be, the length of the video, and a lot of people do not um, stick to those um, restrictions, and they try to load a video, and it gets uh, it gets pulled out, or maybe the content of the video itself uh, is against the guidelines. So again, it doesn't go through. So essentially, it, I think a lot of it boils down to the video content itself, rather than uh, Google just pulling out videos willy nilly. There is a 75 megabyte limit, and I've tested this. Um, it's not actually how many length of minutes, it's actually the file size. And my goal was to make like a one pixel video that was 10 hours long and see if I could upload that to my Google business profile and see if Google would do it. But uh, I have not yet done that test. But I, it's, I've definitely identified that you can have a nice long video, like five minutes, as long as you can get the file size under 75 megabytes. So you might yeah, be the, thinking- The quality will be impacted though, right? Yeah, totally. It's just garbage, but yeah. So, <laughs> um, so SGE, we have a few questions about this one. Uh, so Darren, do you, have you messed around with SGE at all? You know, as a Canadian, I don't have direct access and I haven't really proxied into it, but uh, I've spent a lot of time watching the videos and reading people's articles about it and thinking about it. And, you know, how can we take advantage of it? I don't have an answer to that specific question. 
Um, I do think that we're going to see more of that, especially with yesterday's release with Gemini. I think that the search results are going to have actually kind of similar to how Bing is doing it, where it's like you get your Bing search results and then you get this like AI assistant in the search results. And I kind of think that's what's going to happen. Um, and I do think that local is this very kind of protected -y niche a little bit in a for AI search results because nobody wants the one answer in local not usually you you want to to get some businesses you want to review them you want to evaluate them you want to see all the stuff that's on the google business profile that's why google business profiles have evolved to what they are today they're so content rich and that you can't get that with just like give me a plumber near me and then okay here's one it's like mm, I, can i trust this guy is he gonna wreck my pipes like you you really need to be able to evaluate and so i think local results and we've seen that you know there's a little bit of difference between what you get in the sge packs versus a local pack versus maps and there's always those differences but the the best businesses do tend to surface to the top and so all the stuff that you're currently doing for local seo i think will continue to work um, for the results being pulled by sge Google's not going to write a whole new algorithm on how to rank local businesses. And so everything that you're doing is going to continue to work in SGE. But those are my opinions on it. But, you know, we're still watching everything as it unfolds. Can you also just clarify what SGE is? Just in case there's people listening. Oh, yeah. I think we had a couple questions. Yeah. Search generative experience. Google's great at naming things. They renamed like uh, the the Google business profile dashboard. It's called the NMX, the new merchant experience. They're so bad at naming things. But uh, search generative experience, and it's like generative AI injected into the search results. Search generative experience. That's what it means. I don't know. I think Looker Studio is still the worst rebrand of all time. <laughs> Number one worst. Yeah, for sure. That so was, bad. Was so um, bad. This is a really good one because actually I wanted to touch on this. Really good question. Have you found the same results on mobile versus desktop? This is something that has changed recently. Oh, you asked me a year ago, I would say no. We are seeing so many times now, and there was another question that I saw um, also. Somebody was asking about like local packs being shoved way down on the page, which I've seen tons of those. You get like you know five or six organic results and then the local pack way at the bottom. That is super different on mobile. We see a lot of those where the local pack is shoved at the bottom on desktop. You do the same search on mobile, local packs right at the top. So there is way more variance when it comes to local packs. Um, not who's in them necessarily, but um, who is ranking um, like where on the page. And then also we see on mobile more and more two packs instead of three packs. So instead of listing the top three, they only list the top two. So if you're number three, you could actually be invisible on mobile. So I think that there are a lot of things on mobile that like marketers, we often miss because we're always looking at our computers. Um, the other that is thing you mentioned about that as well, Joy, is it seems like there's less and less uh, local packs uh, appearing uh, as part of search results. So uh, I can't remember who did a study on that, but based on the keyword, uh, the local packs, which used to appear before, suddenly no longer appears, which seems to uh, lead to some questions about how you're going to address this as a local business, right? That means potentially your playing field is being is shrinking. Uh, yeah. And how are you going to mitigate that as a local business? And that's why I would recommend just not focusing on Google exclusively and investigate other avenues to promote your business if you don't want, particularly when SGE comes to life for everyone. I think we, we, we're in for a surprise there. Uh, and you really need to spread yourself a little wider if you want to win as a local business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good advice there. This is a really interesting question. How do you determine if something should be a page or a blog post? I definitely have an answer for this one, but let me know if you guys agree with this. My uh, determining factor go. is usually, is it something that is going to stay relevant long-term, right? So let's just give an example. If I'm blogging about the November core algorithm update, that's really, really good. Now you want the, the newsworthy feature and the benefit of having a date on your um, article. It'll help you rank better. But like, is anybody going to be talking about the core update in November 2023, two years from now? Probably not, right? So that would be a perfect example of one that you would want as a blog post versus, uh, you know, strategies on how to rank on Google is something that is going to change with time, you're going to probably want to update that is one that I would do a page for. 
I have three buckets. I have service pages, like pages about our product services. Those should be dedicated pages. News stuff is in the blog. Educational resource stuff is in the blog. But then really big um, content pieces. That's like this evergreen content. That's, I put that in a new section called resources. And so you might have a section on your website called resources. And then that's because things in the blog can eventually disappear. They kind of get out of the index because of your pagination. If, you, if you're publishing on a regular basis, stuff kind of gets too many clicks away from the homepage. And so the blog is often a place where content goes to die over time. And you will, you may have some blog posts that continue to live because they've gotten some external links that keep them alive. But in general, if you have really good content that is educational, make a section called resources. And then that evergreen content can, uh, it, it gets good internal link equity because it's direct in your navigation and it doesn't just disappear in your blog. All right. Well, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Before we do that, I just want to have Richard put up the link um, for the, the update that we just talked about with the hours. Um, we have our blog live now. So if you guys want to read that after, um, we'll share the link in here. Um, I'm going to pose the last question to Luke to kind of close this out because we're, we're obviously doing this on YouTube, but we haven't really talked as a lot about video. But obviously, Luke, out of all of us here, you are the one that has put the most time and effort into video and you have killed it on YouTube. And this is I'm going to ask you one of the same questions I asked Roger Wakefield in our interview there as a local business. You know, let's say you're a lawyer, a plumber, a lawn care professional. How do you quantify investing time in YouTube when like that's not necessarily how people are searching for local businesses per se. So what is the benefit to a local business being on YouTube? It's phenomenal. Uh, it's just, particularly in our field, in the SEO world, uh, trying to rank for any kind of SEO related keywords, uh, it's almost impossible uh, because it's dominated by some massive uh, websites, you you know them all, and therefore it's it's almost trying to launch your own encyclopedia, trying to compete with Wikipedia. It's just uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, YouTube has given me the platform to reach out to an audience who has found me who wouldn't have found me otherwise, and I think that applies to any kind of vertical. And is this still? I still think it's a much softer environment than. Google itself. Google is saturated with everything. YouTube is following the same path, to be fair. Um, but if you're smart enough, well, if you're practical enough, because otherwise that means I'm smart. But um, if you're if, if you're willing to embrace video marketing, I would thoroughly recommend you do. Not necessarily on YouTube, but because I do believe overall people resonate with uh, visual a lot more than reading content. And it's more about, it's not about YouTube alone. It's about how you exploit the video format in order to generate leads for your business. And there's many, many things you can do with that. So you can launch a YouTube channel. You can look at other platforms, such as TikTok. And many small businesses do that now. Restaurants in particular uh, are very, very uh, good at doing that on TikTok. Uh, and, and if you look at the demographic as well, more and more younger people don't don't use Google to search for the latest fad or the latest trend to go for a drink. They, they're going to go to TikTok. Uh, and if you're not there, you're going to miss out. So it's not just about YouTube. It's about videos in general and how you can capitalize with this type of, of marketing. And once you've embraced the video concept, and I know a lot of business, small business uh, small businesses struggle with making videos, uh, but the benefits are immense, uh, absolutely immense. Uh, and I can't recommend enough uh, embracing that medium if you want to survive as well in, in the next few years. I'll, I'll throw a follow-up question at you that's related. Um, it came up at an automotive conference that I spoke at recently, and it was the concept of like, do you want an in-house person doing these videos or do you want like an agency doing these videos? And they gave me the pros and cons to both. And it's it's quite the debate. Like if you have somebody internal that does it, let's say they're like an awesome personality and then they leave, you know, that's yeah, so th this, this is a tricky one. Uh, I, I always see it from the perspective of, of the small business, the one man band who wants to drum up more, more leads. He's never going to leave his own business, right? He's going to shut down. So it's safe to do it that way. If you're a bigger brand, uh, then, if, even if you become the face of the brand and if you want to sell your business on later on, 
again, you're going to be stuck with something that you can't sell because people won't buy it. So it's there's pros and cons. Uh, but I think you, you could also have a faceless channel. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to have a face on it. Um, it's, it's better if you actually present yourself in the video. I think it's more personal. I think people will see you before you actually turn up at their door and that and I get that all the time I do a lot of uh, one-on-one consultancy uh, and then people already feel like they know me right mm -hmm. I've already broken the ice uh, which is it, it's it's fun because people say oh my god I'm seeing you yeah yeah I'm, I'm a normal human being um, you know I, and and it's it's quite fun and it's almost it helps with conversion as well this is the one thing people feel like they can relate to you and then they call you, you turn up outside their door and they're like, wow, I've got, I've got the guy, right? So I think videos are unbelievable. The reach I had through videos is I got people from Hawaii to Cape Town to, uh, you know, Sydney contacting me saying, hey, can you do this? I'm like, don't you have a local SEO agency around you? You know, it's just crazy. Uh, so yeah, you just go for it. Uh, and then what's the worst that can happen? You know, people are going to laugh. So what? <laughs> okay just try it just try it it's hard guys let me tell you i hate video so me being here took a lot of uh pressure and convincing um so i get it uh to wrap us up we're just going to go through one person at a time and give us if you're a small business let's say you can't afford to hire an agency you're, you're kind of doing it yourself whatever and you only have let's say an hour a week uh to spend on digital marketing seo whatever uh, Darren, we'll start with you. What would you do? What's your one thing? Ugh. Can I only pick one thing? Okay, well, if as long as you're fast, you can you can list a couple. Uh, reviews, content, offer posts. All right, that was quick. All right, Luke, what about you? Just document everything you do through videos. Everything. <laughs> Film yourself. It's just like a fly on the wall, and publish some of that content on your YouTube, on your social media, whatever, one hour a week, that, that should be, that should help a great deal in the long run. Yeah, and mine would be kind of a summary of what we've talked about, which is don't be afraid to give it away, right? Like everyone's afraid, like, oh, I can't talk about my secrets or how to do my job, then they won't hire me. It's like, guys, no, that will establish you as an expert. It'll make people trust you. Um, and frankly, if you don't do it, your competitors are going to give it away. It's, it's the internet. You can find everything. So if you're not doing it, somebody else will. So don't be afraid to embrace that next year. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our channel to, to get notifications for our future webinars. And uh, hope we'll have a wonderful 2024. We will. Thanks for having me. It was thank fun. Thank you very much.